Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. And then Mark chapter 11. Put your finger in Mark chapter 11. We'll read Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Mark chapter 11 Verse 25, whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, We bow before you at a time that we know we are in need of the Word to be preached and the Spirit of God to illumine the truth of the Word to our souls. We have nothing in and of ourselves that we could even bow before you. We only come in the righteousness of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ asking for your mercy in the time of preaching for the preacher and that the hearers would hear the truth of the Word by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the Spirit use the preacher for your glory and the people hear the Word of God unto your glory. We are weak people and we are in need of the Word and Spirit to work in us so that we may live in this complicated world, giving glory unto You. Lord, will You focus our minds by the power of Your Spirit that we would listen and hear well today. That our minds would not go out to strange and odd places, or we would not be thinking of other things in the world because those things will be there for another time. May we focus on these things before us now. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. When we last were in this study on forgiveness, we had come to a place to realize the major foundation and the work of forgiveness in us. We had mentioned two main themes so far that we were working through in the idea of forgiveness as a way of life. This is part two, forgiveness as a way of life, part two. Firstly, we had said we needed to recognize the two major biblical and theological elements of forgiveness. That was pardon, that which is the judicial element of forgiveness. God alone, actually judicially in the great court of heaven, God alone is the one who can forgive sinners. We can't do that judicially. So we are in need of this biblical and theological element, a great understanding of it to see that we need the pardon of God. We need God to pardon us of our sin before Him. We'd also talked about the covering, the second biblical element of forgiveness. Covering, which is a sacrificial element. It is the shed blood of Christ that covers the sins of the people. It is His shed blood alone. Nothing else. And we are in need of that covering. If we don't have these two elements in our mind in a a biblical context, when we think of forgiveness, we will stray far and wide to figure out what forgiveness is. 
And we will make it all sorts of things that it's not. We can even talk to the world about forgiving one another, but if they do not really understand these biblical elements of forgiveness, it will not happen. It will not happen. These biblical elements we'll see this morning are the way in which we move into activity in our own lives as believers. These are foundational principles, elements of forgiveness that we need in order to have forgiveness in our daily lives. If we're going to talk about forgiveness as a way of life, this is the context. We need these two major biblical things to have them in understanding. The pardon of God in a judicial sense and the covering of our sin the putting away of our sin through the shed blood of Christ. And of course, all of that is applied by the Holy Spirit. Secondly, though, we said recognize the two major foundational mentalities of forgiveness. Recognize the two major foundational mentalities. There were biblical theological elements, and then we were going to look at these foundational mentalities. Firstly, Forgive others as you have been forgiven by God. This needs to be a mentality that we work off of. The scripture that we've read this morning plainly teaches this. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. When Matthew wrote his gospel and says, If you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive you your transgressions. This is a mentality that we need to put into our minds. Forgive others as you have been forgiven by God the Father. If you simply want to work at forgiveness in your own power and ability, I can guarantee you, you'll fail at it. A, because the scripture says so. B, because experience proves it. And I need no further experience than what I've known in my own life. If I'm simply trying to forgive somebody of something that they done against me that I think was uh, not right or, or I didn't like it or whatever it may be. If I'm simply trying to do that by my own power, after a while it just doesn't work. I have to think about something different in a biblical foundation and have an understanding here that God the Father has forgiven me, pardoned me through the work of His Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and therefore I need to forgive others as I have been forgiven by God. That's the mentality I need. Not just trying to be a better person. The world's trying to do that all the time. And that gets more complicated. Second mentality, though, is forgive others as though your forgiveness depends upon God the Father. Now, one of the main points here was recognizing two things. We needed to recognize that this type of forgiveness in in mentality is not us working to keep our salvation. You're either converted or you're not. If you are converted, though, you will have a desire to please the Father. That desire to please the Father will cause you to think about forgiveness and act in forgiveness, but mostly first right here, think about forgiveness in the basis of what God has done for you and therefore recognize someone who lives their life saying they, that they are God's child, but they can never forgive anybody else for what they've done. They walk around in anger towards others for what they've done. The problem's not their issue of forgiveness with others. The problem is they never knew God to begin with. You cannot live a complete life of anger towards other people. You cannot go around 
treating other people as the parable of the slave. You remember the slave that was forgiven? He was forgiven much, and when it came time to forgive someone else, he couldn't do it. Why? Because he was not really a child. He was just a tool. We ought to have a desire to forgive others because we have been converted, and therefore, we would want to give back to God in glory and please Him. That's a way that we have some encouragement that we ourselves are growing in Christ is that we're learning to forgive other people even when they might do something against us that we don't like. This mentality moves toward the importance of activity. So thirdly this morning, I want us to recognize the two major consequential activities of forgiveness. Recognize the two major consequential activities of forgiveness. Previously, in more detail, we spoke of the two major biblical theological elements of forgiveness. We spoke of the two major foundational mentalities of forgiveness. And now this morning, we're going to look more in depth at the two major consequential activities of forgiveness. You can have a mentality, but a mentality that really has taken root is something that goes into action. A person can desire to be an athlete. But if that person in their mind, desiring to be an athlete, sits on the couch and daily eats Twinkies and watches TV, is probably not going to accomplish the task. Because their activity is not matching their mentality. Those who are good athletes don't sit daily on the couch and eat Twinkies, which my favorite are the Christmas tree ones, you know those? I hate to admit that. Every year at Christmas, I'm so excited when Beth brings those home. If I sat and ate those every day, what would I turn into? One big Christmas tree (laughs) with sprinkles. You can't say you're, you're going to be an athlete and do that all of the time. Remember, our football coach... One summer, we had a guy that was a, just a mass of a young man. He's a huge lineman. He actually went on to play in, in the pros for the Minnesota Vikings. But he came to summer workouts just out of shape. He couldn't hardly run a sprint without just absolutely falling all over himself. He couldn't make it through even a morning workout. Coach pulled him aside out of the whole group, and he said, what have you been doing all summer? Sitting on the couch, eating Twinkies and bonbons? He said, you got to get the right mentality so that you can get the activity correct. Well, we've said a lot about forgiveness. We've given a lot of foundational principles and a lot of things to think about, and they need to be there. They need to found everything that we're going to say today. Otherwise, if you don't have that foundation, you will try to go out and live these things and try to do it in your own righteousness and glorify yourself. And that's not the goal. When Matthew records the words of Jesus... In chapter 6, 14, he says, For if you forgive others of their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. This passage doesn't just leave us with a subjunctive statement of the if and and, or the if but. It gives us the context to say there is an activity here. Forgive. In Mark chapter 11, 
when Mark records this and says, whenever you stand praying, forgive. We talked about earlier the mentality of forgive others as you have been forgiven. Now we have to talk about the activity. Moving the mentality into an activity. Forgive others as you have been forgiven. It's now an actual activity. Firstly, we need to see it's a mentality altered into actuality. A mentality altered into actuality. What does Nike say? Just do it. Now, they've got a whole other meaning for that. But the Scripture right here is telling us about forgiveness to say, do it. Get into action with it. Those who have repented and believed, get into action with it. No, we cannot judicially or sacrificially forgive someone as God. Yet we must act in forgiveness according to the judicial and sacrificial forgiveness granted to us in Christ. I can't change someone standing before God. Only God can do that. Yet I can act as one who has had their standing changed by the righteousness of Christ alone, nothing I've done. I can act as one who has been pardoned who has had his sin covered, I can't act in a way as putting those things into practice in the life that I live as a Christian. The word here for forgive is the word to send away, leave alone. It's the same word used in Matthew 6, 5 and Matthew 6, 14. To send away, to leave it alone. I think sometimes we want to act as if there's a whole lot of things that we have to put on top of the Scripture and to really clarify something. But right here, Jesus says, forgive. It's just that plain. Now, are there questions? Yeah, and we'll deal with that a little bit later. But the first and foremost mentality of a Christian ought to be forgive. Don't walk around holding everything against everybody. Don't be like the slave or the servant or the one who God dealt with who couldn't show forgiveness to others. The idea of the very phrase and the word that is used here, it's in a command. It's a, or excuse me, it's in a statement. It's it's in an indicative statement. It's saying this is a fact. This is what we as Christians ought to be doing. It's not even up for debate. It's the idea of being able to, To do it and let it go. Let it go. Now, I'm not using just do it and let it go because this is some kind of commercial theme morning or something or Disney day or something like that. When I say let it go now, all you can think about is that Disney movie. Girls spreading ice everywhere. Um, But with forgiveness, we do have to let it go. I mean, the idea is really even here in the Scripture. Think about when Christ is speaking these things about forgiveness... This is Mark chapter 11. This is about the triumphal entry. Christ is going to go into a time of His own own crucifixion. That He Himself would be taken under the grip of, 
a, a local government and taken under the grip of, of Jewish leaders and taken under the grip of the Roman government and he would be whipped and beaten and he would be put onto a cross and he would be questioned as though he had been some kind of criminal, yet he's the son of God walking around among men. What was his mentality hanging on the cross? I have a hard time getting over somebody cutting me off on the interstate in a lane, much less if you hit me or beat me. If you hit me and beat me, first thought, my mind's not going to be that probably, but it needs to be. Christ forgave others who sinned against Him. Why shouldn't His follow, followers forgive others as though they've been forgiven by God? Think even about Christ's disciples. Because you can say, oh, Brandon, you're bringing up Jesus and he was perfect. Don't use him as, as an example. Well, he ought to be the, the best example we have. But think about Christ's disciples. They forgave others that sinned against them. Think of somebody like Stephen. <laughs> can you imagine preaching the sermon that Stephen preached, and then at the end of it, nobody applauded. He didn't get a standing ovation. Nobody said amen. He didn't hear a, a, a well up of people stand around and go, amen, brother, preach it. They're throwing rocks at him. As he's finishing, they're, they're killing him. Nobody even stepped in. Nobody tried to stop it. There was no moral outrage. And what did Stephen do? Scripture says, They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord do not hold this sin against them. <laughs> Stephen didn't have the authority like Christ to forgive sins. We talked about Christ's authority to forgive sins. Stephen didn't have that authority. He didn't even have the authority to pay the debt of the sins of the people who were stoning him. Yet he did have the ability to call out to God and ask for mercy and leave all of it in God's hands. He showed a willingness to express in words and action the forgiveness that he knew he had been shown in Christ. Stephen was not a perfect man, he was a disciple like many of us who have repented and believed. This is an extreme example. The man's being stoned, and yet he's willing to hand it over to God. And the way he hands it over to God is ask for mercy. Now we know it's very likely that everybody standing there in that group that was stoning him, they will not all receive mercy. But you know what Stephen was saying? God, I'm leaving it in your hands. It's yours to avenge. I'm going to ask for mercy because that's what I've received from you. But God, I know what you, you will do is good and right. And if you choose to pardon any of these people, or all of them, or none of them, then you will have done what is good and right. But I leave it to you. Now once again, I remind you, when I started this first part of this sermon two weeks ago, I told you, I feel the weight of these things. It's like I'm walking on thin ice myself. Because I know there are places that I don't carry this mentality in my own life. 
I'm not preaching at you this morning. I'm preaching to me, hoping that you catch some of it. We need the Spirit of God to deal with our souls. That we would walk this way and talk this way and live this way as Christians. Some of the offenses committed against Christ and His disciples were not as extreme as Stephen's. They were less of an issue. Maybe even some of them were petty. Can you imagine how many times someone called the disciples names? They even made fun of them or mocked them. They mocked them for something they said. They mocked them for what they looked like. They mocked them for how they lived and walked around. But you don't see Jesus encouraging the disciples every time they're mocked. Go punch somebody in the face. Go get right in their grill and just get after them. You just give those people what for. You see Jesus encouraging His disciples to do that? I'm certain the disciples failed, and they did. But for the number of times that they were mocked and made fun of, they were always having to learn to forgive others as ones who had been forgiven by God. Were they perfect? No. No, they weren't. Are you and I perfect? No, we're not. But I can't claim my imperfection as an excuse for my unwillingness to act in accordance to the forgiveness God has given me. Even in the death of some of the other disciples, they look toward forgiveness. Can you imagine them sitting and hearing the words of Christ in Matthew chapter 6? And Mark chapter 11. They were still learning, still growing, still having to deal with what these words meant. Are you starting to get the weight of what Mark records? Forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. There's weight to that. Honestly, it would be a lot easier to skip over some of these passages because I wouldn't have to think about it myself. But there's a weight to those words that we have to to deal with. It's the idea that the disciples were learning that there was a time that they had to put the sin of others aside. They couldn't actually judicially or even actually cover the sins of those people, but they had to take that mentality and use the mentality of that word, aphiemi, put aside, send it away, and they had to use that mentality and put it into action to say, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to put it aside. I'm not going to walk around having that dictate all my life. How many times has someone said something about you, done something against you, and it has really either A, hurt you, or made you very angry? This world is full of hurt. It's full of hate. It's full of difficulty. It's full of problems. All you have to do is just watch around you for a moment. And you see it everywhere. Sin has made this world a chaotic and difficult place. Complex, complicated, frustrating, and not very joyful if you're looking for joy in this world. Sadly though, the world doesn't want real forgiveness. 
The world likes the chaos. Are there times that we should desire someone's repentance for a sin? Yes. But I can guarantee you that, that this one thing is true. If you live your life always waiting for someone to repent to you before you give forgiveness, you will live with a lot of anger and frustration. You and I have to take the mentality in the Scripture and put it into action first. How many times do we hold on to the petty thing of someone else or even the sin of someone else against us and we let it drive us? Some of us grew up with imperfect parents and homes and family members. Are we going to let that drive us? Or can we take the forgiveness that we've understood in Christ, apply it in our lives, and move forward? Putting some things behind. Leaving it to God. God will sort it out. He will deal with it. The Word promises it. Romans 12 promises it. He will deal with it. But for you and I to carry the burden of of being so angry about this thing or that thing or this sin against me, to continue with that day in and day out. Honestly, if you understand properly, that's the way of the world. What we see now has been building and building and building because there's all types of anger in the world. It's not just America. It's every place, every nation. There's difficulty and frustration and hurt and it builds and it builds because man doesn't truly want forgiveness. Man wants vengeance. How many times have you seen a movie where at the very end the bad guy gets it and in this little place inside you say, yeah, if I were there I'd have given it to him too. I can guarantee you God will avenge His people. He will avenge them. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. He'll do it. But you and I don't have to wish it on everybody all the time. If you understand the wrath of God poured out on sinners, if you've come to understand what you've been saved from in your own heart, you would not wish it on anyone else. You would hope to God, as Stephen preached, Lord, have mercy on those who have sinned against me. Even if these are mental and emotional sins and things have been done against you, pray that the Lord would give you the ability to move on from those things. To set them aside, as the Word says. Put them away. Send them away. Lord, let me move on and not live my life as if I'm I'm a person always looking for vengeance. You may be asking a question this morning, and it's a really good question if you're asking it. It's the first question is, how? How? How can I do this? Well, you can't. <laughs> but for those who are believers, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. What do you think the Spirit of God is doing? You think the Spirit of God really genuinely indwells the believer and works in our souls and deals with us? The Scripture says He does. The Scripture says the Spirit of God works in the souls of believers. 
We have the Spirit of God indwelling us. He enables us not only to repent and believe of our own sin, but in sanctification, He enables us to go to God and take sins that have been committed against us and frustrations and all types of things and commit those to Him and to ask for mercy that we would not live a life of anger. been many books written over the years about the forgotten Holy Spirit. Sometimes the Spirit of God is misused in terminology and language. Sometimes the Spirit of God is blamed for all kinds of things the Spirit of God doesn't do. But we know that the Spirit of God indwells believers. That in our very souls, the Spirit of God is working. For those who have repented and believed, we've been enabled to do so because the Spirit of God regenerated us. He moved us. He changed us from death to life. And sometimes I really need to stop and think a minute that that same Spirit that enabled me to repent and believe is the same Spirit that would enable me to forgive others. Because I need to take that which is in my heart, which I have anchored there, whether it's in anger or frustration or hurt or whatever it is, and I need to ask the Lord to give me the spirit of forgiveness that has been shown to me. It is possible, it is workable. It is doable. Will you be perfect on this earth? No, that's why it's called sanctification. You're in a process. When you don't do it, go to the Lord. This is the type of process the disciples were having to live through and learn and grow in, and we're in the same thing. But the Spirit of God indwells us gives us that ability. When we look at this this statement, uh, to to stand praying, forgive. It, It just ought to be what we do. It's kind of hard to recognize that. But it's why we need the Holy Spirit. One author said, This then is the governing rule. Unless an offense requires confrontation, excuse me, a serious offense requires confrontation, then unconditional, unilateral forgiveness should cover the transgression. The offended party in suffering the offense is following in the footsteps of Christ. This writer says this ought to be the governing rule. Why should this be the governing rule? If everything that's done to us, we have to go confront everybody over what's been done to us. Let's just play that out just for a moment in marriages. Every time something is done against you by your spouse or it bothers you or it, it takes you this way or that way, whatever it may be, and there's varying degrees of that. There's sometimes there's little things that happen and it bothers you a little bit. There's other times bigger things happen and it bothers you a lot. There's sometimes things happen and it just torques you out of the frame. And think about it for a minute. In your marriages, every time something is said or done or something happens, if you spend your marriage confronting each other over absolutely everything, how's that going to go? That's going to be tough, isn't it? If you live a life of confrontation because you think everybody's sinning against you all the time, then you've not understood forgiveness. There ought to be a governing rule. Unless there's some serious offense that requires confrontation, then unconditional unilateral forgiveness should cover the transgression. Sometimes you just have to move on from something and... Say, Lord, give me the grace to move on. I don't really know why they said that. Maybe it's not the time to even talk about why they said that. 
Sometimes you just have to move on. If we can't use this governing idea as a rule, it'll hinder us from moving forward in the righteousness of Christ for daily living. If you can't and I can't seek to learn and grow in forgiving others, then we will struggle to move forward. The other thing it will do is if we can't use this as a governing rule in living life, we become a clanging symbol and the nagging drip who confronts every person in every instance of personal offense against ourselves. Now I want you to think about it for a minute. Would you want someone to work with, live with, or be around that confronted you for absolutely everything that ever bothered them about who you are and your activity and personality? Is that what you would want? Because after a while, wouldn't you get tired of that? Wouldn't it get old? Does it mean that other people don't need to grow? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means we have to be thoughtful about how we're going to deal with those matters. And I can guarantee you the first rule of dealing with those matters is not to confront the person every single time. Do you know what you did? May I sit with you a moment? And let us speak about these matters. Today you did one, two, three, four, five. That's on Monday. And by Friday, we've added up to 462 different things that someone has done. And we've told them all of them. This is just not the mentality of Christ. It's a mentality that the disciples were having to learn to work through, to grow in. One pastor wrote this, and I think this is a good statement to end on this morning. We'll end here. As Christians, we should be obsessed with forgiveness, not vengeance. As Christians, we should be obsessed with forgiveness, not vengeance. I just have to admit, that can be difficult sometimes. But to follow Christ means to follow the truth of His perfect life. I may want all that His death and resurrection meant, but I first have to recognize all that His life did. And he lived perfectly. He who had no sin became sin for us. As Christians, we ought to be obsessed with forgiveness, not vengeance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you've been merciful once again to give us a time to worship and glory in you alone. Lord, whatever questions may be in our mind about this teaching, may we hold on to those and put them off for a moment that we would think about the base mentality and base activity of a Christian. May we dig our wells deep in that foundation and then see later how questions apply once we've really sought to understand what it means to have forgiveness as a way of life. May we glory in your Son alone through the precious work, his person, and his blood that was shed for sinners. May we glory in him alone. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Hymn number 147.